This is a world on purpose. A purposeful life is the most important kind and the most valuable kind of life. Every choice that we make makes a difference, for better or worse. I loved walking in a village and seeing the before and after. This is the podcast dedicated to those humans choosing to live larger by working for the greater good. And these are their stories. Stories of hope and of true change that come from living on purpose. What if you were to suddenly say there are no challenges, there are only opportunities? Regardless of where you come from, your financial identity should determine where you end up in life. I'm your host, Alyssa Fisher-Harris, and my hope is that my inspiring guests will take you on an introspective journey that helps you tap into your own pivot to purpose, bringing greater meaning to your life. Welcome to A World on Purpose. Hey, everybody. It's me, your host, Alyssa Fisher-Harris of A World on Purpose. And um, thank you again for coming and tuning in, uh, hopefully on a regular basis and getting very excited about all of these amazing guests that I have on the show that are just sharing their incredible purpose uh, and mission-driven stories with all of you as hopefully vehicles to ignite, inspire, and get you all excited about living in the world on purpose yourselves. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of context today for my guest. Uh, my guest today is Ms. Danny Washington, and I was super, super jazzed to have been connected to her through some very dear friends of mine. Um, one of which uh, interviewed Danny actually on his own show, Michael Scheibel, who I had on my podcast uh, several episodes ago, and he has a platform called Travel with Meaning. He was connected to Danny and did a great job interviewing her. And um, he and his fiance were uh, Nicole, one of my best friends, were like, "Hey, you've got to interview Danny Washington. She's phenomenal." And I remembered that interview and how much impact she had left on me watching her incredible story and everything she does completely fits into this ethos that we're calling living in the world on purpose. Um, most of her information, obviously, I don't want to give it all away, like I say, but I just do like to set the stage a little bit. She is uh, incredible. You're going to fall in love with her as much as I did. Uh, she's gorgeous. She's smart. She's brilliant. She's kind of an old soul, I can tell. Um, and she is a world-renowned television host and science communicator and also founder of a lifestyle brand that we talk about at the end of the show called Mocha Mermaid. And she explains why she called it that. So you've got to tune in to the very end to listen because it's super cool. I'm telling you, I'm not just saying that. It is very cool. Um, she also happens to be the very first African-American woman to host a nationally broadcast syndicated science television series. And her whole niche is all around this conversation around called science communication. It's kind of a new emerging uh, entertainment um, platform and idea of getting not just adults, but kids especially involved in the conversation around science and what it means to understand and learn and know science and taking science and putting it complicated terms into not just um, easier to understand and comprehend terms, but also really fun and engaging because science can be really fun if you have the right way of approaching it. And especially we talk about how we believe that the kids obviously are the future and the ones that are going to help us, you know, hopefully put our planet back together and restore this incredible faith in humanity that we would all like to continue to have. Um, you're going to be blown away by her. I mean, she literally has only been doing this for a little over a decade. And, you know, she'll talk about this story about winning a prize money back after she graduated from college and starting a nonprofit with the money, which is just says a lot about her character. So without further ado, she's phenomenal. I am so excited for you to meet Miss Danny Washington. Please, please, please get ready to sit and listen. Oh, and also, by the way, her extreme impact focus is really oceans because she grew up in Miami and she's super passionate about oceans, but she does everything she can to help people understand how the oceans connects everyone and what we all need to do to hopefully save, preserve, restore, and protect our oceans as well as people and planet. So please tune in and listen to me and Miss Danny Washington have a great conversation. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to A World on Purpose with me, your ever-enthusiastic host of Purpose, Alyssa Fisher-Harris. And I am here today with my beautiful and brilliant guest, Ms. Danny Washington. I'm super excited to get into this episode. You know that my goal in life is to shine an amazing spotlight on these incredible purpose change-making heroes 
heroes to me, heroes to humanity, heroes to the planet that are all living with the intention of doing something larger than themselves, something for the greater good, which also brings them greater meaning to their life. That's the whole theme of the show. So Ms. Danny Washington, I'll just give a few little snippets and then I will introduce her. She is a world-renowned television host, science communicator, which we're going to go into what that is, and also known as Mocha Mermaid. And she happens to also be the first African-American woman to host a nationally broadcast syndicated science television series. And she is a sci Calm trailblazer, and I'm going to let you tell her, let her tell you what that means. Um, she's also presently host of the Genius Generation, a new podcast focused on young people behind an incredible invention, an entrepreneurial pursuit, or discovery using science. So without further ado, welcome the very gorgeous, talented, beautiful, and really inspiring to me and a lot of young people, Ms. Danny Washington. Welcome to A World on Purpose, Danny. Thank you so much, Alyssa. It's great to be here. And it's always like so funny when people are introducing, I don't know if this happens to you, but when they're introducing you, it's like, what do I do? Do I just like yeah, <laughs> wait. stand and nod? It's all good. But thank <laughs> you for that eloquent and really generous introduction. I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. Well, it's, I only speak the truth and it's, you are all of those things and more, and I can't wait for everyone to hear about your story. So before we, we go into it, why don't you just tell everybody where you're, um, as you say in the industry, broadcasting from? Where am I actually located right now? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm currently on the West Coast in LA. I spend part of my time here, but a lot of my time in Miami, where I'm originally from, that is home base for me. And uh, it's always good to be able to, to explore both coastlines. I love I love LA. I love California in general. And of course, it's the home and hub of the industry that I work in. So it only makes sense that I spend at least part of my time here. Absolutely. And we're going to dive into that um, for sure, because a lot of your career has actually been in the entertainment industry as a host of all these all these awesome shows that inspire uh, young people and humans around science. So, Danny, you know, kind of the, the theme of the show here and like um, what I'm trying to do in terms of getting people excited about living in the world on purpose with the intention of doing greater good. And so let's just start with your background, because it's really cool. And um, for anyone who is watching or will want to go, once we talk about Danny's website, she's got the most awesome timeline of her life here, which is so cool in a visual that I love. So let's <laughs> just start with who is Ms. Danny Washington? Where did you come from besides planet Earth? And uh, what's your background and how you got here? Sure. Well, first of all, shout out to C3 Social for creating that timeline for me. She designed my entire website. So big ups to Corinne. Um, but yeah, my background, I was born and raised in Miami, Florida. I ended up going to the University of Miami to study marine science and biology because that was my lifelong passion. I easily, I mean, I fell in love with the ocean from a very young age with access to such beautiful beaches like we have in South Florida. And then from there, after studying marine science and kind of getting a taste of what it would be like to become a researcher by working with PhD candidates and other, you know, folks at my university in the graduate school, I recognized at the end of my undergrad that I was really more well-equipped to become a communicator, someone who could bridge the gap between the science community and everyone else. More like a catalyst, right? Someone who would just be able to have both groups communicate with each other because especially now, the times that we're living through, all of the challenges that we're facing globally, all of them really are rooted in knowledge of science and, and people's lack of knowledge of science is now showing because a lot of folks don't understand why things are happening the way they are, whether it's climate change, whether it's the pandemic, these are all related to understanding the way the world works. And if we make better decisions, if we make science-based decisions, I think we would be in a much better place. Um, so long story short, after graduating from college, I got my first job with a group called Untamed Science, and we made science videos for textbooks with Pearson Publishing for about three years, K through 12 science subjects, everything from high school chemistry to elementary you know, biology, like it, it was so much fun. I learned everything I know about filmmaking during those three years. I really consider that time kind of like my film school. Mm -hmm. um, and it definitely confirmed this thought or notion that I had at the time at, as a 21 year old that I wanted to work in front of the camera and behind the camera as well. And so after that, I ended up landing my very first show in 2016 with Fox Network. It's a syndicated science show called Nature Knows Best, and it still lives today on Amazon Prime. So you can watch episodes there. It's like 26 episodes, two seasons awesome. of uh, cool content about biomimicry, learning about how we can use nature's innate design to apply to our own technology and and other designs that we create in the world. Cool. Nature has 
There's a lot to tell us. It's just about paying attention. And that's what scientists and researchers and inventors are doing. So I absolutely love working on that show. And then speed up to today, I've worked on several other productions, including Mission Unstoppable as a correspondent on CBS. And I've worked with the Science Channel as well as Discovery Channel. And it's just been an incredible journey, learning as I go all trial and error, figuring out how can I be a voice and a face that's relatable and exciting and fun, um, especially for kids to learn from um, and to to learn about our world. And that's really my, the core of my mission. That's fantastic. And you were kind of, um, I remember you telling me when we first had our little pre-call that you were kind of accidentally discovered also through (laughs) a, a YouTube video. I love to hear that because with everything that's going on in the world now, with the accessibility of everyone being able to do content on their own, like even me, like I'm, you know, I've never done this before. I'm living my dream for the first time and to know that you have this capability, but you were sort of like on the forefront of getting discovered on YouTube. Can you talk a little bit about that fun experience for you and how that shaped everything? Definitely. Uh, I really love this story because it, it speaks to the testament of like, what this whole podcast is about. It's about living a purpose-driven life. And when you have a purpose, when you discover your purpose and you create, you create manifestations and you start speaking it out loud, it will happen. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> you just have to be available for it, right? Like a lot of people don't even realize that their blessing is coming in their way because they're not available. Right. But in my case, when I was working on um, just getting out of college, finishing my senior thesis, I submitted a video to a contest with the surf brand Roxy, uh, sister brand to Quicksilver. And they did this one time, you know, they haven't done it since, a contest called the Follow Your Heart Tour, where they asked young women to submit videos about what they're passionate about. So I asked a friend to come out to the beach with me. We made a video with my little cousins and a couple of their friends. We talked about plastic pollution. I ended up winning the contest, won $10,000, used that money to start my nonprofit, which still exists today, called Big Blue and You. Mm -hmm. Um, And then simultaneously, that same video was seen by a guy named Rob Nelson, who was uh, one of the founding members of Untamed Science. And he asked if I would audition for their team. And that's how I got my first job as a science communicator. Because of one single video on YouTube, this was 2008. So YouTube was still very young. It was Mm -hmm. still like popular for cat videos at that time. (laughs) (laughs) And it was only about three years old. Yeah. So it was a brand new platform. Yeah. And then speed up to 2016 when I, when I landed my first national show, it was because of YouTube again. I didn't, I don't, I still don't have a major following on YouTube actually, because YouTube is a lot of work for those who know about YouTube, yep. um, but I love it. But I did have a few things up, me diving in different places, a couple of like fun videos and um, a TV development uh, you know, producer found some of those videos. And that's how I got the first, uh, I guess, discovery for my first show. So it was really serendipitous. And it was just about learning to put myself out there, not be afraid of what would come my way and just letting it be and surrendering to whatever would come. Exactly. And that's what I love about that story so much. Cause you were just like, you didn't have any limiting beliefs. You were just right. like, I'm going to try it. I'm going to see what happens. <laughs> you know, not where I'm sure you maybe were a little attached, but not totally attached to the outcome and look what happened. It's, it's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I would say, I mean, it's definitely been a growth process, you know, going through my twenties, it was challenging. Mm-hmm. I've worked every kind of job, you know, whether it was hosting at a restaurant or working for a tech company, working as a promo girl for different products. Like I've, I've taken these jobs because I wanted the flexibility and the freedom to continue to pursue my dream. Yeah. And there were times where I really, really, really wanted to give up because I wasn't making enough money to support myself, but thanks to family and really good friends who believed in my dream as well. um, Whether they let me you know, crash on their couch for a couple of weeks, or they, you know, gave me a loan just to get by like this, these are my community, my village of people who have surrounded me throughout my, my life um, have been the, the real heroes. And I'm just forever grateful to each and every one of them. Well, you're obviously easy to believe in, but when we have people to believe in us, it definitely makes a, a huge difference. Um, let's talk a little bit about, uh, if we, if you don't mind, just a little bit about your community and your childhood and growing up. I know that you have a Jamaican heritage background and growing up in Miami, which is super fun and cool and you're the ocean. Like, <laughs> What were some of the things that growing up in a community like that, the Jamaican community is very warm and, and loving and um, all about lifting each other up and then being able to be by the ocean too, and sort of witnessing as you're learning as a child, and then you go to school for marine biology, seeing what's happening in the ocean, that's become kind of your, even though you do a bunch of science stuff, and we'll get into all of this science comms communication thing, 
the ocean was your passion, right? And what did you see as a young person? And then as you got older and started studying it, that made you want to trigger and really center your world around oceans? Well, I would say, you know, seeing the the quick progression of the degradation that's happening in the ocean around, you know, South Florida was really startling for me. Um, beginning to notice things when I was in high school, that was the first time I started to notice because I was starting to learn about marine science. I went to an amazing magnet program in Broward, Fort Lauderdale area uh, at South Broward High that allowed us to go on tons of field trips. So even like our local beach in Fort Lauderdale, we saw that there was a lot of erosion happening. And within the four years I was in school, it had, you know, depleted by like lots of feet. So we were like, what is happening right now? So that forced me to ask questions. And as I continued to dig deeper into the different issues concerning the South Florida community and our coastlines, the more it became apparent that I needed to speak up and, and just Take, find some kind of megaphone uh, and, and just let everybody know, like, we have to do something about this now. This is our home. And so by starting Big Blue and You, that was my first kind of act and, and, and movement into activism mm -hmm. and trying to empower and not just empower, because empower can be a little bit of a difficult word. I would say inform, educate, and then inspire young people to want to take action themselves and to bring that information and knowledge back to their homes. Because mm -hmm. as you know, as adults, a lot of us are stuck in our ways and it's very difficult to change our behaviors. But when it comes to young people and children, if you give them the information, they're so well-informed, especially now that they're like, what, this makes no sense. Like they see the connections. Uh, they're, they're, they were born into the digital age where they have access to lots of information. So why not just give them the tools and the access uh, to understand the world around them a little bit more. So that's really where it, it kind of all began. And then my Jamaican heritage has always taught me about unity. Um, right. When you go to Jamaica, you recognize that it's almost like the world, all the world is represented on this tiny little island. And, you know, it to, to me, it's a reminder that, yeah, this entire planet, we're all connected. We're all one. It's one people. Really? Like, yep. that's it. There's nothing else. There's no, you know, uh, how, how melanated you are, how much money you have, how old you are. It's none of that matters. All that matters is that we are human beings and we're in this together. Yeah, I feel the same way. I, I, I think we shared a little bit about each other. Like um, I, most of the, my, my listeners know this. I grew up homeless as a kid, uh, living in a car on and off for the first 13 years of my life. And it really helped me understand the perils of humanity and how we all we all are human and we're all subject to you know, negative things and positive things, and we have to be there for each other. And so I, I love that uh, you feel the same way about that. Cause it, if you think about it, the ocean connects all of us too, right? Like it connects our exactly. islands. <laughs> so yes. it's like, it's like, the, yeah. Um, I I'm curious too, if, if, um, you know, coming from Jamaica and seeing like just with climate and all the devastation we've had with the hurricanes and, you know, some ecosystems changes on, on the island specifically and in areas of, of Miami that you spent time, um, I'm guessing like most people who are in the science and climate world, you're concerned probably about what's Absolutely. going on. Yeah, more than concerned because what we're seeing is that uh, majority of times people of color, um, BIPOC community around the world are at the front lines of being disproportionately impacted by climate change in the most negative way, whether it's flooding, coastal degradation, pollution, mm -hmm. all of these things are facing um, communities that look like me. Mm -hmm. And that is a major concern. And it's, it's really about information and understanding that Again, every single behavior that we 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 do on a daily basis as individuals does have a repercussion. It does impact someone somewhere. And if we can make better choices every single day, uh, whether that's reducing, again, our carbon footprint, how much carbon are we consuming on a daily basis? How much single waste, uh, single use waste are you creating um, in your own home? Right. Are you planting and, and growing your own food? Um, are you giving money and resources to people who need it the most, the people that are on these front lines that I'm talking about? These are all actions that we can take every single day. Mm -hmm. um, but I just want to see more people understand that our, our, our burning of fossil fuels, this, this, this particular behavior is what is driving climate change. This is what's driving all of the destruction that's happening. And we, as a society, have to decide right now if we're going to transition into a clean energy economy, mm. that's really the only option. We don't have any other option. We're mm. at the, we're at the deadline. We're crossing so many different planetary boundaries that are bringing us to the brink, to the ledge that we will not be able to return from. So 
it's either now or never. And these next 10 years, this next decade is really going to ter- determine a lot. And for you and I, I'm hoping that we will have another few decades, if not you know, longer to yeah. be here. And I want to make sure and see this transition through. And that's really what um, my messaging is about. But it's also about like love for the planet, love for nature and love for each other. Because mm-hmm. if we don't have that, there's going to be no driving force. There's going to be no motivation to actually do the things that we need to do to get us to where we need to go. Right. We have to appreciate and see the value in what is around us and, and who's in our lives. And Absolutely. that's just a, a shift in, in mindset and perspective. Absolutely. And then, and then, um, Back to thank you for sharing all that. That's it's such great information. And back to too, the idea of saying we hope for you and me that we have you know some decades left. You're also focusing on the the generations after us. That's where yeah. a lot of your focus is on youth. And so let's talk a little bit about um, a lot of the work you're doing, a lot of the programs that you've done, and this really cool um, kind of new. It's like it's like an emerging form of communication called SciComm or science communication. You're kind of like on the forefront of that, which is awesome. Could you talk a little bit about what that is and how you feel uh, not only your role is going to influence these incredibly impassioned youth who like literally are probably going to help us save the planet alongside <laughs> you, but, but um, what you are trying to do with science communication um also in marginalized communities, especially like kids who don't probably have an opportunity to be able to have access to this kind of information as readily. Definitely. So, you know, I think Marie Curie said it best. She's like, uh, nothing is to be feared. It's just to be understood. Mm. And when it comes to SciComm, it's about explaining what's going on so that people have a better understanding of systems and connections and the way things work, because the planet was here far longer than we have been here. And it had a perfect system going and it still does. We're just doing too much. We are altering these systems. We're adding factors that nature doesn't quite understand why it's there, but it's happening. And we're pushing, like I said before, we're pushing a lot of planetary boundaries, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, and by understanding science and getting those basic concepts down as simple as the scientific method, like understanding the scientific method is a great framework for individuals to make decisions on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. It puts you in a a position where you're making an objective decision, looking at all the factors, taking notes, getting other opinions, coming up with an idea and hypothesis, and then, you know, finally coming to a conclusion and then collaborating with other people about their conclusions. And this is where healthy dialogue begins. I think a lot of the things that are ailing our, our society right now are because of misunderstandings mm-hmm. and lack of communication because everyone needs to understand that each person has their own lived experience and their own vantage point. And the more that you take time to understand that, the better off you'll be. And, you know, and when you mentioned limiting beliefs earlier, I think with youth, they've, they're shining so bright right now and they're taking this torch to make sure that we pay attention to what's happening to the planet mm-hmm. and, and to people right now. And, even though it's not even really their burden to carry. They didn't create this mess, but they're here. They know that it's their future that's at stake. So they're doing everything in their power, but we can't let them do that alone. Us mm-hmm. adults have to have to step up and to really make some changes that um, will impact them years down the road. Do you find that working with youth too, that um, do they voice with you um, their very real fears that sort of get squashed and like, oh, that's, you don't need to be fearful of that, but are they very scared? Like, they're, yes. so, they're so aware. Yes. Climate anxiety is real. It is so real. And I can't, I can't even imagine being 10, 11 years old and seeing all of this uh, tragedy and destruction happening around the world mm-hmm. and, and trying to process that, you know, as a nineties kid, I, we had television then, but the internet was just fledgling little thing at that time. And um, we just didn't have as much access to the world like these young people do today. And I'm overwhelmed as a 34 year old, every time that I look at the news or look at my Instagram feed, I'm like, Oh my gosh, how do we even like just compartmentalize all this? So I understand. And I totally empathize with what the next generation is going through. So that's what keeps me motivated every day to keep doing the work that I'm doing. I know that it's not in vain. I may not see the fruits of that labor right now, but I'm hoping that it'll be there, you know, years down the road. Yeah. And then the other thing you're doing with it too, with science communication, it's very cool. It's sort of back early on when I was doing stuff um, about a decade ago, they were talking about this idea of edutainment, which was education integrated with entertainment. You're kind of doing the same thing with science and you're taking complicated science terminology and concepts and putting them into very um, 
understandable, user-friendly and fun and engaging content for these, for these kids, but also adults too. But right. Isn't that sort of your whole mission? Yes, definitely. When my day job, of the things that I love to do to make a living, yes, is to create dialogue around science and around concepts about nature in a fun and engaging way. When I was growing up with Bill Nye, the science guy on television, you know, he was my only example of that. Right. And, for, and it, he's still one of the primary examples that people think of when it comes to talking about science on television. Mm-hmm. But he fits a narrative that we're all not when I say we're all I'm talking about the people who are in SciComm right now are, are trying to break the mold from right We're mm-hmm. we're shifting from just that typical stereotype of a scientist being a white male in a lab coat, you know, yeah. it can, anyone can be a scientist, right? It doesn't have to just fit that demographic. <laughs> and so by working in television, that was an intentional, you know, goal was to figure out, okay, what's the best way to get visible? You have to go on TV, right? Yeah. And mm-hmm. at that time, you know, when I was 21, social media was just starting to take off. So it's not, it was nowhere near where it is today as far as um, reach, but mm-hmm. TV seemed like, okay, that, that works. So that became the purpose that I set out for. And I had no clue how to, <laughs> to get on TV. <laughs> I didn't have like network contacts. I didn't have an agent. I didn't have wow. any of that. Like it was just figuring it out and, so cool. and getting as much experience as possible. And so um, it's been really, really fun. I think my jobs, the odd jobs that I mentioned before, like they all served a purpose in that journey. Mm-hmm. I laugh today because like, sometimes I'll be reading voiceovers and I'm like, Oh, now I remember when I was in high school, I was that nerd. I loved reading out loud in class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was That's one of those great. students, but I loved learning. That's it. Right. You know, right. but also the reading out loud was like, this was practice for me to get ready to do voiceovers. <laughs> so cool. Yeah. I know. Isn't it funny how some of the things you do in life, I I call it this, it's, I don't, it sounds like you're the same. I don't have a linear like progression through my career path. It's all these crazy different yeah. things that I've done in my life that didn't seem to make sense at the time that now all culminate to making sense. And like you, I mean, I've done everything. I was a restaurant. I worked at a restaurant. I was a checker at a grocery store. Like I've done it all um, to get to where I am now. And, and it does kind of, everything teaches you something along the way. It's a skill set, you know, to, Mm -hmm. to, but I'd love to reference really quick too the um, idea you were talking about uh, of, you know, the, the one white guy in the science coat being the inspiration for science. I mean, you're a product of the nineties. I'm a product of the seventies and eighties. I was born in seventies. That's how old I am and scary. But back then (laughs) we had, we had mutual of Omaha, you know, like with a guy. And then we had, of course, our very dear friends who we all love and know Philippe, uh, and and uh, Alexander Cousteau's grandfather, uh, Jacques Cousteau, was amazing. But even for me as a young woman, I didn't have anybody really to, I love science, but I was intimidated by it. And I didn't have anyone to inspire me to think that I could do it. So I went up, I went the other way and went into communications from a written literary English standpoint. And I have always been fascinated by science. Like I wanted to be an archaeologist. I wanted to be this, I wanted, but I didn't think I could do it. So I'd love yeah. to talk a little bit about something we touched on in our pre-call too, which is specifically one of your passions is about empowering young girls and not to take boys out of the equation or men out of the equation because anyone can suffer from, you know, not feeling like they can do something. But traditionally throughout history, girls have not been encouraged to pursue these paths. STEM is coming around. I'd love for you to talk about your involvement with that and what you're seeing in terms of the the changes, the shifts uh, to support young women in science. There are lots of shifts happening right now headed in a positive direction. And I'm so happy to have been a part of a lot of projects that are focused solely on empowering young girls and making sure that they know that um, imposter syndrome is real Mm -hmm. and many of us suffer from it, but it's about overcoming that imposter syndrome and pushing through it and finding mentors and role models that will be able to help kind of guide your path because everyone's path is very different. So for me, When I was 17 years old, I met one of my role models, Dr. Sylvia Earle, who is an incredible marine biologist, um, as well as an ocean advocate. She has a show, you know, uh, her own documentary on Netflix called Mission Blue. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, she's so awesome. Mm -hmm. And she's already in her 80s now. And she's been, you know, hustling since day one to make sure that women are represented in the the marine science space. And from then on, I was like, okay, if Sylvia can do it, then I can find a way to do it. And every chapter of my life I've gone through, I've made sure to find a mentor that really could be hands-on with me, that could 
guide me that would be willing to talk to me on the phone or have a meeting with me and like show me some opportunities that I didn't see that were in my blind spots. Um, yeah. And just help me move through things and get, get to the other side. And so I'm so grateful for that. And I've had several male allies as well who have served as mentors to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's essential. You have to, you have to find that as a, as a woman, or non-binary person who is pursuing something that you don't see yourself in, you have to find those role models and mentors. I, that's like numero uno um, rule. Like you just have to do it. But beyond that, I think it's about giving girls the visibility and and again showing that you can do both. You can be beautiful. You can be smart. You can be a math genius. You can be a lab technician. You can be an engineer. You can do all of these things and also have a family and do the things that society tells us that we are supposed to do. We are life givers, right? As you know, yep. um, as women, and it's an important part, but we can, we can still pursue our dreams. And mm-hmm. so that to me is, it all begins with representation and visibility. That's great. Um, do you find that when you're engaging with kids specifically, do you see a difference in their enthusiasm, interest uh, amongst um you know, the genders or, or ages specifically? These days. Yes, I do. I do see a difference because in the past, generally, I think there've been several studies about this, but in general, we'll see that a lot of girls will fade away from their interest in science or mathematics or any STEM subject in middle school, whether Mm -hmm. it's because a teacher discouraged them or they felt intimidated um, or even at home, they were encouraged to continue. So Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of the ideal age to get in there and to show them like, no, hey, 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 you can do this. And that's why I love Mission Unstoppable. That that series, the first season that I participated in was really fun because we profiled lots of different women from around the nation working in different STEM fields and, and making it interesting and showing, again, the balance of their life and their journey and how they got there. Mm-hmm. And that to me just saves so much time. If we can get a little, just catch a few notes about how this woman did this, this, and this, how she got there. I just want to see that this next generation of girls have more access to opportunity as well. Yeah, I agree with you. And it looks like too, a lot of the different platforms, the social media platforms are getting into their own content too, because you did a very fun show, which has a fun swear word in it. (laughs) Can't say it, but science, the S-H-I-T out of it on Facebook, right? Facebook decided to step into this uh, arena also. What was that experience like doing it with an actual social media platform uh, backing you up on that? That was so much fun. That was back in 2018. Uh, I filmed that in New York with my co-host, Christina Hutchinson, who's a female comedian. Mm -hmm. And the concept was to combine comedy and science and to talk about the scientific method and apply it to random questions that people Google or search online for. So we answered everything from like, um, is it really, do chiropractors really work to like hangover (laughs) strategies? It was across the board. (laughs) But I had such a blast filming that series and it was really meant for um, millennials actually. That was our target demo. So a bit of an older audience. And it was produced by Insider, the media brand, and they partnered with Facebook Watch to, to air it online. That's cool. But I do love that you integrated comedy with it because I think we were just talking about earlier, the children, especially having so much fear. um, I'm guessing as part of your content, you try to also create this sense of like hope, not that it has to be doom and gloom messaging, right? But like, what can we do about it? How can we be actionable? Um, Which I like to ask my guests too. Um, You know, we're going to get into it in a little bit when we do some questions, but like, what are some actionable things that people can do to make a difference in climate and oceans and in their path to purpose. Um, So we'll talk about that in a few minutes. I'll give you those questions, but I was curious if you would just tell me a little bit too about um, uh, big blue and you and what you guys are specifically doing with that, because I love that you started that with your, with your prize money. That was so, I mean, that is like exactly living in the world on purpose. You could have done anything with that money, but you're like, no, I'm going to start this nonprofit and I'm going to make a difference in the world. Could you talk about that? Because it's really impressive. Well, thank you. Yes, of course. So Big Blue and You, my mom and I actually co-founded back in 2008 together. So cool. when I won that prize money, she was like, okay, well, what do you want to do? And, da, da, da. and I, at the time, nonprofit seemed to be the best way to serve my community mm-hmm. and to also build a legacy. So as a 21-year-old thinking about what what's going to be here after I'm, after I'm gone, mm-hmm. that's really what I aim to create. And 13 years later, we're still here. We're still standing. We're one of the, one of the only, I can literally count on one hand, 
how many organizations around the world that exist that were founded by women of color, as well as run by women of color serving, you know, underrepresented children. Like this is, it's, it's a major thing in the ocean world, at least. Mm-hmm. And so we've aimed to just bring our community together about our blue backyard and to give them more information and understanding about what's at stake here. But like you said, making sure that it continues to have this theme of hope and um, and positivity, ocean optimism is everything. Mm. If we if we focus on the doom and gloom, there's no there's no going forward. We might as well just let let it go, just let it run its course. But I don't believe in that. I believe that the ocean is resilient, and so are people. Mm-hmm. If they're given the time, the space to recover and restore, and then we have to actually take part in that restoration. So you know, the ocean is a provider of the oxygen we breathe, food we eat, maintains yep, our climate. Absolutely. These are essential things that the ocean provides for us. And it covers three fourths of our planet. There's a reason why the ocean is here, but it's so big. It's vast. It's really out of sight and out of mind for a lot of people, especially people who live inland, but they're just as connected as we are on the coastlines to the ocean. Mm -hmm. So it all begins with us. And so Big Blue and You, we've created activities like Art by the Sea, which is a festival celebrating the ocean. We talk about the issues. We keep it real. And we're like, look, ocean acidification is a real thing. It's it's causing all of our animals that have car- calcium carbonate shells to, to literally melt, right? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. we need to fix that. The next thing is shark finning. We're seeing 100 million sharks a year being killed for their fins for a soup. That's mm-hmm. not, doesn't even have any taste. So we teach them about all these issues, but then we offer a solution. And we Mm -hmm. connect them with a scientist and an artist who are working in tandem at our festival with these different hands-on activities. So they're learning while they're playing. There's drumming, dancing, paddleboarding, kayaking, like you name it. Like the day is so much fun. I absolutely love Art by the Sea because, again, it's a celebration. It's about recognizing what we do have, what is left. It is worth saving and we have to do our part. Everybody can do their part no matter how old they are. Absolutely. Oh my God. I love that so much. Are you, I'm, I guess you weren't able to do it obviously last year with the pandemic. No. Is that something you're going to try to bring back uh, in a, in person? Or are you going to try to do that virtually maybe again or? Yeah, well, we've been working diligently since the pandemic began and trying to restructure how the organization works. And we've come up with a plan um, for a virtual program called Sea Squad. And we're getting ready to launch actually this month, which I'm very excited about. It's a partnership collaboration with our sister org, Pangea Seed Foundation in Hawaii. Oh, and nice. they, they do tremendous work because they connect artists um, all over the world to create ocean art that will inspire and engage. And it's all rooted in science. And they have a festival called Sea Walls where they bring artists into different cities and they, they'll paint like 10 or 15 murals in a couple of weeks and just beautify the community that they're in, bring in local artists as well, and just raise awareness um, for, for the ocean. That's awesome. So good. <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. Um, I want to talk a little bit, though, too, about, if you don't mind, what it is you're trying to do to help educate kids around the importance of the ocean and science who really actually live in the middle of the country and don't have connections to the ocean specifically. I grew up in Colorado, didn't see an ocean until I was, oh my gosh, I, I don't think I saw an ocean until I was honestly like 17, 18. And um, people don't realize that our, again, our whole country is intrinsically, our whole world is intrinsically connected by the oceans, even our rivers. And so like for me, I live here in Napa Valley. I, I left Los Angeles, which is where you are in October after living there 20 years by the ocean, which I miss so much. But coming back to Napa Valley, I see the huge impact of both what's happening in the ocean and climate here because our rivers are very dry. Our Mm. hillsides are dry. We have fires. Like, can you talk a little bit about what you're doing in terms of educating people and getting them enthusiastic about oceans and climate if they haven't had an emotional connection to that because they've never seen it? Well, every single drop of water on the planet is connected to the ocean, whether it's fresh or salt water. And we're seeing these drastic changes in weather patterns because of climate change, because the ocean is going through what it's going through right now. Um, We're going to see this shift happening and things are not going to be how they were before. There will be areas that will experience drought. There will be areas that will will experience extreme heat, um, extreme cold. Uh, We've seen all these examples in the last few years. And what is startling for me is like, you know, I remember learning about climate change in in middle school. That's when I first started to understand Mm -hmm. the concept of it. And for sure, the way that they were teaching it, it was 
like, this is going to happen 50 years down the road. You're probably going to be really old when it happens. I'm like, no, it's happening right now. (laughs) And it's happening a lot sooner. And scientists have been warning us about this. Um, So it's my job as someone who runs an organization like Big Blue and You to create this line of communication with young people who, especially who live inland, those who don't have access to information, um, like many other children do, finding ways to talk about it that um, will meet those folks where they are that Mm -hmm. that's really the idea because a lot of times i think especially with science communications we see sometimes um experts coming in and kind of talking down to people and making them feel as though Mm -hmm. they don't know Mm -hmm. anything and that your people are just going to shut off as soon as that happens i agree how do you make it relatable and um and connected like to their daily lives like this is this is the thing that our science communication has to do. And we have to continually adjust and pivot and figure out better ways to speak to specific audiences because it's super nuanced. Yeah, I agree. And on that note then, so you've now jumped into the podcast world and I'd love to talk a little bit about, um, you know, meeting people where they are. That's kind of what I'm doing with this podcast. It's a wonderful medium of communication. Let's talk a little bit about the genius generation. Who is your audience for that? And um, what kind of guests do you have on and what is this similarly the same theme of science messaging you're trying to do with that or expand it out uh, to other topics? Well, I absolutely love the Genius Generation podcast. It's brought to audiences by Seeker and Trax. And Trax makes a podcast specifically for tweens and teens. Oh, and so this cool. is the audience that we were aiming for. We really were going for like the nine to 12 year olds who, you know, not surprisingly, sometimes get left out of a lot of content. It's either like, content for the little ones or content for the older teens. But like this particular group, especially in that formative stage of their lives where they're going through puberty, they're doing all, everything is just up in the air. It's great to have been a part of a project that is about giving them inspiration about how they can actually begin to change the world right now, right here. And so all of the guests that we brought onto the Genius Generation podcast were under the age of 18 when they came up with an incredible invention, started a business or a nonprofit, or just had an idea that they brought to life. Um, But these were like expansive and massive things that these teenagers and young people did. Everything from creating the first COVID-19 tracking website. Wow. To kidding me. Building. Yeah. It's insane. Um, Avi Schiffman is the one who did that. Mm -hmm. And then there was a young lady who uh, started to work on the Flint water crisis by creating a a water contamination test with her middle school chemistry teacher. Mm -hmm. Like she would stay after school with her and, and they developed this test and now they ship it out to different places. So people have access to understanding whether or not their water is contaminated before drinking it. And then there was another story of a young man who built his own, um, wildfire, like warning system, a camera system that was run by AI and using algorithms to, to map and see and make sure and monitor different uh, wildfires. It's like, I could go on and on. You just yes. have to listen to the podcast to, to understand the, the gravity and the, the breadth of, of knowledge that these young people have. Yeah, I listened to the one with the the gal who created the the test for Flint, um, w- which was extraordinary. I definitely want to know the person, the young man who created the fire warning one, because that's where I am now. <laughs> I'm in fire country. Yes. I would love to connect him everywhere up here. <laughs> um, that is so cool. I love that you have a podcast for that audience. I just think that's so 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 exciting. Are you going to continue it on? Is it seasonal or was it just a uh, we did. It's seasonal for now. I don't know if uh, we I haven't had word about a season two just yet, but we have 22 episodes that are already live. OK. And the good thing is the episodes last between, you know, 10 to 15 minutes. So they're short. You can listen to them in the car on the way to the grocery store. Like, great. Great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. OK, cool. Yeah. Kids, their attention span isn't quite. Well, I guess adults don't have that great of attention span either these days. No. So. <laughs> We're doing the best we can on this one. We're an hour here. Um, so on that, I think that's so cool. Thank you, Danny, for sharing that. I love that. Everyone will know where to find it. We'll have obviously links to all of your great stuff on, on a well done purpose. Um, so that's all of your amazing work and the impact you're making in the world. And and I would love for you to share. Um, I, I kind of like to also sort of dive into a little bit on the personal side of pursuing a purpose path. It's, you know, you hinted at it a little bit where you had to take some odd jobs and do some things you you felt like giving up. A lot of people feel that way when they start an adventure, number one, anything entrepreneurial, 
having nothing to do with purpose or impact is hard enough as it is. But when you try to weave purpose or impact into it, it makes it, sometimes it feels like it's 10 times harder. What were some of the challenges that you faced on this path? I mean, you've come such a long way in such a short period of time. It's, it's so incredible, but I'm sure you've had moments that there were some specific things you wouldn't mind sharing and what you did to sort of pull yourself out of that feeling of, of like giving up or like, oh, I'm never going to be able to do this. Mm, mm, such a great question. Mm. So I would say the first time that I really felt that deep pain of failure would have would probably be 2015. I had moved out to LA for a couple of years, you know, again, just just moved out here on a whim, by the way. I was going Amazing. to a project in Papua New Guinea and there was a layover in LA and I asked the producer, please don't book me a flight back to Florida. I want to stay in LA and I just want to see what happens. Wow. And that was the scariest decision ever, but mm-hmm. I, I did it and I landed on my feet and I had a couple of people that I knew, uh, no family, but enough people that were able to like kind of guide me as I landed in this huge pond of lots of fish, right? Yeah. Trying to pursue the same thing in yeah. the entertainment world. Um, but in, by 2015, I really hit a wall and I burnt out big time. And I had to just give up. I had to move back in with my parents back in Florida, start Mm -hmm. over from scratch. And I really felt like I failed, but thanks to the support of my parents, my wonderful, amazing parents um, who welcomed me home back home with open arms. You know, I know a lot of people, not everyone's lucky to have that. Mm -hmm. Um, But I was able to live with them, pull back the pieces and then refocus in on why I went out to LA in the first place. It's to pursue this very specific role as a science communicator and presenter. And even though people didn't quite get it at the time when I first arrived in LA, it was like, no, oh, this is this is what I'm meant to do. And so with that, started building my my website. I redid my whole website. Um, you know, started building a team. And then out of the blue, that's when I get that email a year and a half later mm-hmm. from the develop the development um, producer who wanted me to try out for the Nature Knows Best show. And that was after I had surrendered, I had given up. I said, I got to just pull back. Let me start from scratch one more time. <laughs> Let's do this again. Wow. And, and that's really, really important. And just getting back to yourself, you know, this industry will eat you alive if you let it. And the amount of rejection that you get from from square one is mm-hmm. is inconceivable for a lot of people to get that many no's yeah. after, after one after another. You really have to build a a certain level of resilience. Definitely. And and it's nice that you had your family uh to fall back on, which is wonderful. Was there anything else in particular that you might have done that you could give um as a tool of, of, for people to use, like, was there any personal development stuff you did or meditation or some kind of specific outreach? Yoga. To something? Yoga. Me too, man. <laughs> yoga. 30 years. Uh huh. Yes. Yes. Yoga <laughs> has been one of my saving graces and meditation as well. You know, um, I definitely have a spirit, spiritual practice and I, I pray a lot and I have to continue to to recalibrate using those tools. And that really just helps in the most stressful moments. But I would also say that the ocean is one of my greatest teachers and it Mm -hmm. always will be. And every time that I step into the water, it's like a reset and it clears my mind. It pulls me back to my purpose. So that's why I try to get to the beach as much as possible whenever I can, just to get in the water. I mean, just last weekend I went and had a beautiful day with some friends close, like basically my LA family and a pot of dolphins showed up. Oh, and I, love I kid you so not, much. Oh. since I've come to LA and, and moved to the, like, you know, spent a lot of time in the West Coast. Every time I go to the Pacific, dolphins pull up for me. And they're, they're definitely a major totem in my life. And I know it's cliche. Everybody loves dolphins. They're so cute, but it's true. They're amazing animals. And they're probably the most closely related uh, marine animals to us humans because they experience emotions. They have family units, they're matriarchal. Like there's all these levels of intelligence that cetaceans express. And like, I just really connect with that. So I was just so grateful to see them. They were playing, they were, you know, throwing their tail flukes up in the air. They were spy hopping Love and it. they were literally like 75 yards from the shoreline. And I was just like, Oh, yes. Oh, it's so <laughs> cool. I think, I think for me too, I agree with you dolphins. I was very blessed to have two incidences, one on my 50th birthday last year in the middle of COVID. My, oh, wow. I hadn't been around anyone for months and months and months, like the rest of the world. And my friends, I love them all so much. You know who you all are. Uh, they're all still in LA and I miss them. They did a special birthday for me. It was socially distanced. And literally at sunset, 
on my 50th birthday, this giant pot of dolphins came as the sun was going down. And for, we were all just like, oh my God, it was awesome. And then, um, so that was a good omen. And then I got to actually swim with them in the wild. It wasn't, the, oh. yeah, it wasn't the kind that is the, I wouldn't ever go to a place where they farmed or whatever. It was these ones that they had, the science and biologists had tracked and that you got to swim with them. And it was like, magical they were as huge mm -hmm. as a Winnebago almost and they were just so but they <laughs> yeah. were so playful and gentle and kind I agree with you I I love them so yeah. very yeah. cool thanks for sharing that um so this is the uh, this is this is just so awesome there's just so much good goodness in your story and in your work and I'm just yep. deeply deeply honored to have you um here you're welcome but um my I, you know I've been doing I've been like you, I'm just testing this whole thing out, trying to live my dream, doing this podcast. And I've been getting a lot of feedback and people are like, it would be fun if you did like a rapid fire. I have no idea if this will stick because I've done it only a couple of times, but we're going to do a rapid fire question thing, which is a way for people to get to know you a little bit. Some other little tidbits. It. You ready? Are okay. you game? You haven't heard I'm these game. before. Okay. Let's do it. Yes. If, if you definitely don't want to answer one, you could just say pass. I won't be offended. <laughs> okay. Um, some of them are kind of purpose related and some of them are just fun, goofy things. So uh, here we go. We're going to start with the first one. What was the most memorable act of kindness that you did for someone or that someone did for you? Ooh, wow. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot. I think the most memorable has to be with the houseless community here in LA. Mm -hmm. Whenever I, I see someone or they cross my path or I cross their path, like I do whatever I can to just give them whatever I have. It's mm -hmm. cash in my wallet. If I can buy them a meal, I do that. Um, and that to me is one of the most fulfilling things um, to help, you know, my brothers and sisters who are out here, you know, struggling. I agree. I've spent many years working homeless advocacy in LA and it's, it's the most heartbreaking thing that you can ever see. So that's a very good, a good answer. I'm the same. Um, thank you for sharing that. What is your favorite guilty pleasure? Mm, favorite guilty pleasure actually eating these things called pastelitos they're cuban pastries Ooh. and they're my favorite <laughs> they're like that fluff you know croissant oh. type um dough with guava and cheese in the middle oh my gosh oh that sounds amazing. So every time i i'm home i have to go get my pastelitos and maybe a cuban <laughs> coffee to go with it that is my indulgence right there <laughs> okay i'm gonna make a mental note of that when i go to miami that I have to get yes. one of those. That sounds awesome. Um, okay. Who is someone that you admire that is kind of a purpose hero, either known or unknown? Mm, 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 mm. Purpose hero, purpose hero. Uh, I think one, one person I would definitely mention uh, would be my, one of my godmothers. Her name is Overill and she's Jamaican and she's one of my mom's dearest friends. And she really, uh, I've been surrounded by so many amazing aunties or godmothers in my life, you know, growing up in a single parent home. Um, my dad is absolutely in my life and I love him to pieces. But when I was a child, it was really just primarily me and my mom at home. And she was my primary provider. And uh, yeah, these aunties that I had in my life were just, amazing guiding lights and overall was one of the first and she's still in my life to this day mm -hmm. and has always always encouraged me to just do what i need to do follow my purpose stay focused and i just love her so much oh i love that that's great um okay what is uh if there is one thing you could say what is the one thing that inspires you to get up every day the one thing that inspires me to get up every day is uh the ocean it still remains the one thing that keeps me going and um, inspires me all the time. Great. I had a feeling you'd say that, but <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Me too. Um, even though I'm not by it anymore. Um, okay. If you had to pick a theme song for your life, what might it be? Beyonce formation. Awesome. <laughs> I'm a huge Beyonce fan. Good. Me too. <laughs> I like, I'm not ashamed. It is. She is incredible and her work ethic and focus and drive, like get me motivated every day. So whenever I'm feeling down, I just throw on Beyonce's playlist and I'm, I'm money. I'm good. I'm like, <laughs> I know what I want to do and I have to go do it. And I just love the way that she represents women in general. I agree. I totally agree. That's a great choice. Um, okay. Finish this sentence. When I dance, I look like I look like it's <laughs> <laughs> kind of a goofy one, but I didn't make all these up by the way <laughs> they were given to me. We might veto some of them. I look like a dance hall queen 
And for those of you who know Jamaican culture, you'll know what that is, but not maybe not as extreme as a dancehall queen, but like close to it. I love <laughs> dancing and I, I love, it's just a freeing experience for me. So every movement, every, every little twerk, every little whatever, I just, I, I just love dancing so much. I love it. I'm the same. And uh, getting older, when you get older, there's nowhere to dance anymore. So I'm going to have to Google dance hall queen and, and like ping that for myself. That's awesome. Um, okay. This is a hard one, I know. But if you could sum up in one word what it means to live your purpose or live in the world on purpose, what would that word be? Intention. Mm, very nice. Okay. A couple more. What's a cool, fun fact about you that people may not know? Cool fun fact about me would be that I love quilting. I like wow. working with my hands. Yeah. Like I used to be into carpentry when I was younger, but these days the latest craft that I have is is quilting. I have my own sewing machine and everything. Wow. That how do you do that <laughs> with everything else you're doing? That's amazing. <laughs> uh, well, you know, it, it whenever I can. I still have this massive like dolphin quilt actually that I made that needs to be finished up. So that's oh, one of my wow. summer projects. That's awesome. It's probably like meditation, I bet, in a way, huh? <laughs> like a moving meditation. It is. It is. Yes. Okay. What is uh, a couple more? What is your favorite city in the world and why? If you have one. Mm. My favorite city in the world. Wow. That is a hard question. Um, I would actually say New Orleans. Mm. I really love New Orleans. If I had to pick it on this side of the world, um, because it's such a fusion of culture and music and food. And I've spent many years going there in the summertime for a festival, Essence Festival, the, mm -hmm. like the magazine that came mm -hmm. out yeah. you know, that's been around since the 70s. Um, it's an incredible celebration of Black culture and Black women. Mm -hmm. And it energizes me every single year. I'm so sad I couldn't go last year, but 2019 was a, was a banger. It was amazing. Awesome. We had so many great artists. Michelle Obama showed up, spoke oh, there and God. like... And it's always just all positivity. So being in New Orleans, experiencing Essence Festival really has, it holds a really special place in my heart. And I just, I just love going there. That's awesome. I love New Orleans too. Did you get to go see the Preservation Hall band? I've seen the Preservation Hall oh, band a few that. times. Um, yeah. I love going to the French Quarter. I love Me getting too. beignets and I love the history too. There's a lot of, a lot of history there that we as Americans need to know, especially Definitely you know, just, all, I mean, all around. So Definitely. if you haven't been to New Orleans, go to New Orleans. I agree. And by the way, if I ever meet, if I ever had the pleasure of meeting Michelle Obama, that's probably the point in my life where I would just pass out cold, like just from <laughs> absolute, I would geek out on her completely and pass out. <laughs> She's my hero. Um, oh my God, that is amazing. so cool that you guys would be around her. I know. Okay. Two more questions. What is the one thing that you do to stay the course and positive? We kind of answered this already, I guess with yoga, but, mm -hmm. um, Let's just skip that one because you kind of already okay. answered that, I think. Okay. If there's one nugget of advice you can give listeners that are struggling to step into their purpose and are fearful to seek or live their purpose, what would that be? It would be to tap into your childlike curiosity. Go back in time in your mind when you were six, seven years old. What were the things that kind of set your soul on fire, things that made you excited and happy? And go back to that. Excavate those thoughts and those memories and figure out how you can apply those things to your, your life right now. How can you tap back into those things that really made you happy and brought joy into your life? That is where I think the, the core purpose will be revealed to you. Oh my God, Danny, that's great. Um, <laughs> that's another one of my favorite answers. So I'm going to have to chalk that up on the list of faves. Thank you so much for that. I think people will find that very uh, apropos and moving. Ms. Danny Washington. You are extraordinary in every way, and I cannot thank you enough for the time. I know how busy you are, and um, you know I'm just a little startup show, and for you to <laughs> take a chance on me, I can't tell you how much it means to me. Thank you so much for coming on A World on Purpose. Oh, you're very welcome. Absolute pleasure speaking with you. Thanks for all these great questions, and the time flew by so fast. I know it did. It to did. You. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going to have to, if you don't mind, I'm going to have to ping you and ask you for like full on hosting advice. Like I am not in my ego. If you have any tips, I'll take it. And I got um, you. thank you. I, Cause you're, I've watched all your stuff and you're just so naturally amazingly good at, at all of it. Um, and very thank inspiring. You. You're welcome. And, um, one last thing before we go, why don't you tell everybody where they can find you the easiest place they can find you? 
Sure. Uh, you can find me on my website, dannywashington.com. That's Danny, two N's and an I. And then I'm on all social platforms with the same handle with my name. So check us out. Um, I've got links to all of my projects on my website. So that's a great place to start. And then if you want to support Big Blue and You, please check out bigblueandyou.org. Mm-hmm. Oh, and one last thing. I yeah. never mentioned my adventures as a mermaid. I am the Mocha Mermaid. Oh uh, my as many God. people know me. <laughs> How did we not touch on that? Okay, go for it. Explain. (laughs) I'll give you the quick spiel. So I actually own my own, you know, mermaid fins. The idea of being a mermaid, when I spoke about tap into your childhood interests, mermaiding and being a mermaid was definitely a, an interest of mine as a kid. And so as, as of right now, as the last five years, I've been tapping back into that. Like, what does it mean to be a mermaid? It's half human, half, you know, I would say half dolphin because of the way that the fins move, but, um, Anyway, I started a lifestyle brand called Mocha Mermaid, and that's at mochamermaid.com. And it's bringing together a community of, I guess, underrepresented mermaids, because a lot of times people, you know, identify mermaids as having fair skin, straight hair, and that's not true. I think mermaid ideas and mermaid mythology has been mm-hmm. present since the dawn of humanity. We've seen these water deities all over the world, from African culture um, to, you know, Japan, like there, there there's so many different stories that we can share that showcase mermaids of all different, um, you know, walks of life. So I just want to build that community of people who love mermaids. And if you believe that you're a mermaid, join the fun, come with (laughs) us. But the bottom line is that mermaids, real mermaids are fierce defenders and protectors of the ocean. And that's what my, my intention is with that project is just to continue to build up this group of, of humans who really truly care about the ocean. Wonderful. I love that. That is fantastic. And Mocha Mermaid, we will, I'm so sorry that we didn't touch on that earlier because that is so <laughs> profound and important. Um, so everyone, um, you will be able to find all of Danny's information that she mentioned here, obviously, um, at, at her website, but also on a World on Purpose website and in the show notes. And please, please, please follow her work. Uh, she's just such an, an inspiring woman. And I know that she's going to make some serious change in the world. And just Danny, you're going to light the fire under all these young kids. I know it. And you're going to make this whole new generation of people of young people that want to like make a difference in the world. So thank you again for being here and sharing your story. And thank you. Yeah, no, I'm great to be. I thought you were going to say something else. <laughs> I, I, I think I was, but I forgot what it was. So we're just human. Anyway, thank you again, Danny Washington. And for everyone who's tuning in um, all the time that you come back to A World on Purpose to listen to these amazing stories, I really appreciate your time and your effort. I'm your host, Alyssa Fisher Harris. Please, please remember. Oh, that's right. I'm supposed to. This is also Danny, something I'm not good at. I'm a horrible self promoter. And <laughs> I've only just started saying, please remember to go to Apple Podcasts. Rate, review, subscribe. Give us a little plug if you love the show. Give us your feedback. We really, really appreciate your time and want it. And let us know what you think of all of our amazing guests like Ms. Danny Washington. And so with that, I will say good day, good evening, good afternoon, where we are in the world. I'm your host, Alyssa Fisher-Harris, and we will see you soon. Thank you for taking this journey into a world on purpose with our incredible guests. To learn more about our amazing guests and their inspiring purpose-driven work, please go to aworldonpurpose.com. Don't forget to look at our call to action of the week to mobilize your desire for purpose into action. A World on Purpose can be found on Apple Podcasts and all the major podcast platforms, and the video version can be found on YouTube. If what you heard today inspires you, please write a review and like and share on the platform of your choice. We'd love to also hear from you and learn your pivot to purpose and the meaningful work that you do that lifts humanity. Send your stories to info at aworldonpurpose.com. I'd like to thank our World on Purpose team for making this show a reality. Once again, I'm your host, Alyssa Fisher-Harris. Thank you for tuning in to A World on Purpose. I look forward to seeing you soon.